Asha DeBose is a Sri Lankan marine biologist. She is the founder of the Sri Lankan Blue Whale Project, which is the first long-term study of blue whales in the North Indian Ocean. And her work has led to this whale being designated by the International Whaling Commission as a species in need of urgent conservation um, measures and research. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about my story with uh, the research that I do. Um, I work with this incredible population of blue whales uh, in the northern Indian Ocean. And um, um, I call them the unorthodox whales because they really break the stereotypes we had built for a lot of the species, the large whale species we had. And I'll tell you a little bit more about that in a second. But I want to start off by telling you a little bit uh, about how I actually began on this particular quest with the blue whales. A lot of people ask me, did you know it was going to be blue whales? How did you know? And I tell them, well, you know, it was very serendipitous. Back in 2003, I was uh, working on this whale research vessel that belonged to Roger Payne, who is the, uh, one of the fathers of Humpback Whale Song, and it was circumnavigating the globe, and it stopped in the Maldives in Sri Lanka. So I got on, I'll be honest, I wrote to them for three months every single day until they let me work on their boat. Um, so persistence is something that I, you know, it's like one of my strongest traits. Um, so, so it was one of these days, I managed to get on the board, I was on, I mean it was an incredible experience. I come from a country where being a marine biologist is extremely unheard of. Um, and so I'm really excited, it's 2003, we're off the southeast coast of Sri Lanka. It's a beautiful day, it's an absolutely stunning day. As you can see from this photograph, flat calm weather. Of course, scorching hot, not an ounce of wind, but it was a beautiful day. And so we're cruising along out there, and the core of the work we were doing at the time was actually we were uh, looking for sperm whales. So we were acoustically tracking them with an underwater microphone called a hydrophone, and we would find them and we would take biopsy samples to do toxicology studies. Lucky for me, that particular day, I happened to be on deck. And I was standing out there listening to my um, CD Walkman. I don't know how many of you remember having one of those, but I definitely did. And you know, like looking out for signs of life. And, and then suddenly out in the distance, I saw this incredible sight. I saw this mighty, powerful, misty blow in the distance that must have been at least 12 feet. And I saw it and I thought, wow. Right? Because we were working with sperm whales all this time and the interesting thing about the blow of a whale is that you can sometimes tell the difference between species based on the shape or the size of the blow. So for example, a sperm whale has only one nostril on the left hand side of its head and so when it exhales you have this left sort of slanted blow. Uh, right whales for example, they have uh, V-shaped blows, some people say heart shaped, but this was something different. It was so big and so tall, it could only have come from a really immense animal. And that's when I realized I was going to see my first blue whale. And I was excited. I was so excited. So I called down to Bob, the captain of the boat, and I'm like, Bob, Bob, I think, I think there's a blue whale in distance. I think we have to go. And he says, sure, whatever, let's do it. So we start moving, and as we start getting closer, I realize that it wasn't just one blue whale. There were six blue whales in, the area, in an area the size of a soccer field. So if you imagine it, each of these animals is as long as this room. Six of them in an area pretty small, when the, ocean, when the world is really 70% ocean. So at that point I was like, what is going on? And I had just come out of undergrad, I was pretty much about seven months out of my undergrad where I did marine biology, I studied you know, marine mammal science and I, I kind of reflected, it was, it's good because that meant I had been studying during my undergrad, so I remembered things. And my textbook said, um, you know, uh, large whales, they t undertake these long range migrations between cold feeding areas and warm breeding and calving areas. So I was like, okay, this is five degrees above the equator, as warm as it can get. I'm going to see whales mating. So I was psyched. No one's ever documented blue whales mating before. Who doesn't want to see males, whales mating? Anyone? 
I mean, it's pretty fascinating. These are large animals. You're thinking, how does it happen? All these questions running through your head, certainly running through mine. I thought that was going to be my moment of fame, right? So I'm like, all right, let's get the cameras out. Let's get the pictures. Let's get the video because this could be precious. We got close and they were definitely not mating. And I was pretty disappointed, you know. My moment was passing, I could see it sliding out of my hand and I'm thinking, well, what is going on? And then I saw this. That's a pile of whale poop. It's beautiful, yes. Potentially the most beautiful poop in the world. If you ever see anything more beautiful, I would really like for you to take a picture or even send me a sample. I can give you my address, no problem. Because I will argue that this is possibly the most beautiful thing I've ever seen. <laughs> and I see this and of course at that point, what do I think? I'm thinking, why is it pooping here? If it's pooping, it's feeding. But it's feeding in warm tropical waters? That is not what my textbook told me. So, lucky for me, I have a curious mind and I was thinking to myself, I said, something special is happening here. Why is it that they are remaining in these waters to feed and potentially breed and calve, which is what they're supposed to be doing there, in a part of the ocean that's not meant to be productive enough or nutrient rich enough to support them? And that, ladies and gentlemen, is where my career began. So I can always say my career started with a pile of shit. <laughs> Not everyone can say that, but I can, and it's true. The other incre incredible lesson I learned that day was that um, those waters are incredibly biodiverse. So I want to show you just a really short video of some of the species that we see. It's just a GoPro camera that we drop in the ocean um, off the side of the boat. Um, and just to give you a small snapshot, this was, these videos were all taken um, over a, about four days, a number of different species that we were seeing. So this is one of the blue whales that we see. Um, you might see little black things hanging off it. Those are remoras. Those are these little fish that get free rides. They attach by the backs of their heads and they filter water as they're traveling through the water ocean, it, which is really cool. Um, you see a Bridie's whales or Brutus whales. They're really beautiful, a little torpedo shaped, smaller than a blue whale, uh, very similar family, baleen whales. Incredibly elusive, very, very hard to film. So we got very lucky because this guy sort of hung out next to us a little bit. Um, spinner dolphins, you can see thousands of dolphins. Um, you can go out and they're incredible. They jump out of the water and spin. And I always say if I, if I was to die and re be reborn, I would want to be a spinner dolphin because they look like they're having a really good time and they have a lot of friends, which is always a good thing to have, I think. Um, and these guys, you can see, they have very sharp, long beaks. Whereas we also see bottlenose dolphins that have stumpier beaks. They're much bigger animals, a bit more robust. They also tend to stare you down when they're bow riding, which is a little bit nerve wracking. Um, unlike the spinner dolphins that don't really make eye contact, which is a little bit <laughs> more comfortable. Um, but these animals are amazing. So this, you know, the oceans are full. Then we have these resource dolphins. And the video is a little bit, uh, um, it's not so great because they're really very hard to film. But these dolphins are really neat because they don't actually have beaks. So we always think of dolphins having beaks. These guys have rounded faces um, and lots of scratches all over their body. And it's cool as I've traveled along the, across the world and seen different populations, you see distinct differences. Um, our guys are dark gray with lots of white scratch marks off in California where I've been for the last two years, they're mostly white and they have scratch marks. So very interesting to see these differences. We see turtles all the time. This guy looks happy and he's swimming around quite freely, but we also have rescued a lot of turtles that have been entangled in uh, um, um, fishing nets and rope and line and manta rays. We see a lot of beautiful manta rays um, that swim through the water. And actually one of the other MCAF grantees, um, my friend Daniel Fernando is from Sri Lanka and he actually studies uh, the market of manta rays because they're killed for their gill rakers. And uh, it's actually a very, very sad story. And I'm not going to give you his presentation, obviously. Um, but these, these animals are incredible and I, I, you know, I, I started to realize that these waters are so underexplored and there's so much beauty in it. And as we all know, you know, we live in this incredibly biodiverse planet 
um, you know, species of animals and plants that have evolved over millions of years. And their survival really is such a precious thing to us because we get so much benefit from them. We get flood control, medicine, food, you name it. Our lives are so dependent on them. But unfortunately, uh, our planet is also facing an extinction crisis. If you look at the mass extinctions that have happened up to now, we've had five, and they've all been driven generally by um, natural causes, you know, asteroids or all these other phenomena. But right now, scientists believe we're going through what is co called the sixth mass extinction. And the sixth mass extinction, I'm very sorry to say, has been driven by us, humans. In fact, if we look at um, global population declines in mammals and birds, remember mammals and birds are two of the most studied groups out there in the world. And you can see where there's red is where you have um, high population declines and yellow is where it's uh, lower population declines. But really, um, there are population declines happening, uh, happening across the board. And uh, WWF produced a Living Planet report just this year. And according to that, it said that um, over two human generations, um, all vertebrate, vertebrate species, their population sizes have halved. So we are facing trouble. The planet is in trouble, for sure. And we, we hear about species extinctions, right? We know there are some species that go get completely wiped out. Every single one of them is taken out of the face of this planet, um, such as um, the Caribbean monk seal. But in the oceans, this is not something that we hear of very often. And we don't know of a lot of species that have gone extinct. And that's not because there aren't many that have gone extinct. But that's because we don't even know what's out there to know what is going extinct. 70% of our planet is oceans, but 95, we've only really explored 5% of that. In that 95% space, who knows what's happening? But what we do see more of in the oceans is what we'd call an ecological extinction. An ecolo uh, ecological extinction is where you take out so many individuals from a population, but not all of them, just so many, that the remaining few can't actually interact with their ecosystem properly, and they can't actually play the role that they would naturally play. So just to explain that a little bit better, I'm going to bring out the classic example of the sea otter. Okay, this is a most simplified food web for the sea otter. But if you look at this, you'll see sea otters are known to eat sea urchins. Sea urchins feast on kelp. And so this keeps the ecosystem in balance. Um, as long as we have all the sea urchins that control the sea, sorry, the sea otters that control the sea urchin numbers that then don't overgraze on the kelp. But back in the 1800s, us humans, we discovered that sea otter pelt is incredibly warm. In fact, sea otters have the densest fur of any, uh, densest hair of any animal. They have one million hairs per square inch. Compared that to a human, we have about 100,000 hairs on our entire heads. So it's extremely dense, extremely warm. In fact, sea otters don't even have blubber because their coats are so warm that that's all they need. So in the 1800s, of course, uh, there was a big um, hunt for sea otters for their, and their pelt sales. And you can see the pelt sales in the London fur market, they sort of start to rise up to about 1884. And then there's this distinct decline in pelt sales in the London fur market. Now, this is not to say that the sales decreased. What it actually shows us is that there were so few sea otters left in the ecosystem that there weren't that many pelts for sale. Luckily, in about 1911, there was a treaty that was signed and, um, of course, the sea otter hunt was banned. But what happens when you take out sea otters from the ecosystem? Sea urchins run buck wild. And they consume all the kelp, they destroy all the kelp beds, and you end up with what we call an urchin barren. So the problem here is that kelp is actually really important for a lot of species. It's nursery grounds for a lot of species. Some of the fish that we eat actually use that kelp uh, forests. And so when you take them all out, it's really disturbing the ecosystem. But lucky for us, of course, with the 1911 treaty and uh, the uh, ban on hunting of sea otters, that meant the kelp was able to come back and the ecosystem has started to go back into balance. But what I'm trying to say here is that ecological extinctions of this nature are something that we see much more commonly in the oceans. 
If we look at predatory fish populations like uh, billfish or tuna, marlin for example, what we see in our oceans today are only 10% of pre-industrialized levels. This is the same case across the board through the Atlantic, the Indian, the Pacific, the tropical, subtropical and temperate oceans, we are seeing exactly the same thing. What we see in the oceans are only 10% of pre-industrialized levels. So how that affects the ecosystem, we still don't fully understand. If we move on to Antarctic whaling, you'll see that um, if you look at just the baleen whales, um, humpbacks were hunted pretty steadily at the start until um, whalers discovered a way to actually hunt and kill blue whales. Now blue whales were a little bit safe for a while because they're so big and so fast but then a Norwegian whaler actually de designed this deck mounted harpoon. It allowed him to be able to catch the blue whales um, and so you can see that they went from humpbacks, they moved on to catching blue whales and then when the blue whale population started started to decline, blue whales are the largest of the baleen whales, they, when it became commercially unviable for them to keep hunting these, they moved on to the next biggest which were the fin whales. When the fin whales started to decline, they moved on to the say whales and then they went from the say whales down to the minke whales which are the smallest baleen whales in our oceans. Now when this was all happening, of course the whalers were pretty pleased with themselves because they, they, there were these quotes that said things like, whaling may have increased the availability of krill to other consumers and uh, the stocks of fur seals and penguins show significant population increases. Now we all know the ocean is not that straightforward, right? You take out a predator, it doesn't mean its prey is proliferating in huge numbers because it's a little more complicated than that. But most importantly, by taking out whales from the ecosystem, we're disrupting the entire ecosystem because whales are what we call ecosystem engineers. Their presence actually helps to mold how the ecosystem works. It determines the presence and absence of all the other species that e interact in that ecosystem. So just to give you a sense of that, when a, a, when a whale dies, um, its carcass will float at the surface for a very short time and it becomes food for a number of species and then after that it starts to sink and as it sinks it goes sometimes to the deepest depths of the ocean 4,000 meters deep places where there's very little or no food available so there are these species like hagfish that are specialized to feed on whale carcasses and they wait for this manna from heaven to just drop so they can feed on it Right? So what happened when we were whaling is that, so this is nutrient cycling vertically and when, when we started whaling and we started taking the whales out of the ecosystem, we, dis we disrupted the abundance and distribution of these carcasses that were available to these species. And so we may have even driven the extinction of a number of species that were highly specialized to feed purely on these whale carcasses. Now global blue whale populations have faced a uh, number of threats. The most one in the, the biggest one in the past was whaling and we'll be all, we are all happy to know that that's really not the biggest threat to whales in the oceans anymore uh, thanks to the moratorium on, uh, on whaling. However, there are a number of other threats that they do face. Climate change, pollution, entanglement, bycatch, those are all significant problems and threats to these animals. But the problem with these are they're not so straightforward to solve, right? If you think about the whaling problem, the whales, there were people hunting whales, you stop the people from hunting whales, the whale populations can start to recover. But there are other threats, like all of these, it's a toxic mess of threats in the oceans. Now with climate change, for example, where do you start? Right? Where do you start to address the problem? Even with entanglement and bycatch, sure they're getting entangled in nets but we don't always know the source of the net so how do we stop that from happening? But there is one threat that is actually fairly tractable and that is ship strike. Ship strike is where whales get hit by ship, uh, ships and get killed. Now the reason I think it's tractable and that there's hope in that area is that Ships travel along very specific pathways in the ocean and if we can identify where those pathways are and where they overlap with whales, we can come up with ways to reduce that risk to the whale populations. So now to tell you a little bit more about that, that's the focus of my work, I'm going to take you across the world to this beautiful tropical island in the Indian Ocean called Sri Lanka. 
the world is of course more colorful than that. I keep saying I need to upgrade this map and put a more beautiful one on, but use your imagination, right? So Sri Lanka is in that red box. It's the beautiful tropical little island, the shape of a teardrop. It's called the Pearl of the Indian Ocean. Um, it is an island of India. It's never been a part of India. Um, and it's its own little beautiful country. And that's where I come from. And that's where I work. And I work on this incredible population of blue whales that are called the Sri Lankan blue whales. They're really interesting because, like I said at the start, they're called the unorthodox whales. And the reason I say that, because they break those stereotypes, right? They do things that my textbook didn't tell me they were supposed to do. For example, they are non-migratory, so they don't take, undertake long-range migrations between cold feeding areas and warm breeding and calving areas. Inter instead, they go laterally. They go down to maybe about the Maldive Islands, and um, they go out to maybe Oman, but they don't leave warm tropical waters, which frankly I think is extremely smart, but perhaps not when you're such a large animal and really need huge abundances of food. These whales are also very cool because they speak a different acoustic dialect to blue whales in other ocean basins. So even if they met a blue whale from the southern Indian Ocean, they wouldn't be able to have any chat. They wouldn't be able to even say hi. Um, they have different behaviors. So these guys will t lift their tail flukes up before a deep dive more often than anywhere else in the world. And it's really interesting to see how they've adapted in this unique environment, in this very restricted, confined space. Unfortunately, they have also been harvested in the past. And I'm very proud to say that no one in the Northern Indian Ocean, none of our countries have ever uh, hunted whales. But in the 1960s, there was illegal Soviet whaling that happened in these waters. And it's really interesting because these Soviet whalers were actually en route to the Antarctic to hunt for large blue whales. And they would stop off in the Northern Indian Ocean, catch a few on the way, and then continue on their journey. So over a, a four seasons, which let me just highlight the fact that each season is maybe one or two months of the year. It's not, a, you know, it's not the whole year. They managed to take out 1,300 blue whales from this very small area. And if you look at the pattern in which they took them out, you'll see in 63, 64, their first season they came out, it was kind of like their pilot study. They were like, well, we can take out a few whales. It seems like a good place. We should come back next year. The next year they come out, they take out almost a thousand blue whales. And then they come back the third season and they're like, they get maybe 200. Come back a fourth season, they get about 30. And it's not because they're catching less, but it's because there was less to catch. And while we don't have a population estimate for these blue whales as yet, what we do know is we're starting from a very low number. And they are in, in trouble. So now to take you on to the core of this work, which is ship strike. This is a map of global shipping traffic. I know there's a lot of noodles on the page. I'm not expecting you to memorize them. There's no quiz at the end, so don't panic. All I want you to look at are the yellow lines. The yellow lines indicate where the densest ship traffic occurs in our oceans. And now for the purposes of our ta this talk, I'm going to zoom in on the area of interest to all of us, which is the Indian Ocean. You see the Northern Indian Ocean? You might be able to pinpoint Sri Lanka right there, right in the center. It's a tiny little gray dot. It's pretty small. I hope you can all see it. And if you look closer, you'll see that it is in the path of one of the busiest shipping lanes in the world. It's the main artery through the Indian Ocean. All traffic from Singapore to Dubai goes right through these waters, five kilometers from shore. So if I zoom in a little closer, just to give you a little more sense, based on some of our data, you can see the black dots on this map our field data. So those are sightings that I've collected by going out on the water and then I've overlapped that with sh data on ship traffic. And you can see the red lines indicate areas of highest uh, shipping traffic. And if you look closely, you realize that very fast off the southern coast of Sri Lanka, there's heavy overlap between shipping lanes and whales. So sites like this aren't uncommon. This is a blue whale that came wrapped on the bow of a container ship into the main harbour in Colombo, in Sri Lanka, back in March 2012. We know that it was killed on impact by, from a ship because it was a pretty fresh carcass showing signs of internal hemorrhaging. 
this isn't an uncommon sight. This is not a one-off. 12 days later, we found a carcass floating at sea that had a huge propeller gash on it that was very indicative of ship strike. So evidence like this is not that common for us because what happens quite often is when a carcass gets hit and killed, uh, a whale gets hit and killed, the carcass will either sink or it will get circulated further offshore. But two in the space of 12 days. Of California, they've done uh, estimates and shown that for each one that we document, at least 10 are going undocumented. So it's a significant problem. And in fact, ship strike is the biggest problem facing all whales in the oceans today. So how do you resolve something like this? I know I was really optimistic at the start, and my personality tends to be optimistic. And I actually believe if you're a conservationist, you sort of have to be optimistic, because all you ever do is write obituaries of all these species and the planet. It could be terrible if you didn't have optimism. But I am optimistic about resolving this threat. I think it is actually possible, and it has been done in certain parts of our world. So what we're trying to do right now is, um, and we're at the tail end of this study, is we're looking, we're building these things called species distribution models. So what we do is we take data on where we know the whales are, and we overlap it with um, um, environmental data. And so it tells us, okay, what are the conditions in these places where these whales are being seen? And then we use a computer algorithm building this model, and we predict where the species can, should be distributed outside the areas that we can go and study. And we kind of come up with what we call a species distribution model. And here I'm going to show you a very preliminary model. The data, this has been upgraded since, but it's a pretty good representation of what this work does. So you can see in this map the black dots. The black dots represent all the sightings we've collected, whaling data that we've collected over, the, over time, and also some uh, data collected by other teams that have done surveys in the area. And that's the data we used to overlap with, to bring together with the environmental data to pr produce this heat map. And the areas which are bright red are essentially where we believe that there should be high densities of whales. So the next step of this is to assess risk. And how we plan to do this is actually based on some work that's been done, uh, that was done off Southern California. So uh, all the people who worked on that problem in Southern California, which is ship strike, um, are now working on my project with me. So it's really great because it's this transferring of skills and I don't have to reinvent the wheel where, and it makes things a lot faster than if I, we had to relearn and start from scratch. And so what happened in California, it's, it's a little bit different, but you'll see where the similarities are. So here's a map of um, tanker vessel traffic density of Southern California. And um, the black dotted line you will see uh, inside of that towards land is where um, they set this rule called the carb rule. So what they said was if a ship or a tanker wanted to come close to shore, they had to switch from the inefficient fuels they were using to cleaner, more efficient fuels. So after a while, the ship captains were like, well, this is actually a little bit more expensive than if we were to just move further offshore. So instead, that's what they did. Instead of switching fuels, they just moved further offshore. And you can see those orange and red lines, those squiggly lines are actually uh, real data of ship tra uh, tracks. The red area is where the highest density of ship tracks are. So you can see now there's a lot of ships that are using this particular zone just south of the, um, the islands out there, the Channel Islands. And so when this happened, a lot of people were like, wait a second, there's all these whales here. What's, the, what's happening with the whales? If you just shift your shipping lane as you please, how does that impact the whales? And so they did a risk assessment for humpbacks. And here's the result. So you can see, this is exactly the approach we're using for our blue whales. The black dots indicate sightings, places where they know the whales exist. This is for humpback whales. The pink and the coloration shows different densities of the predicted densities of the whales. So pink is where they're predicting there'll be high densities of humpbacks. And as you go all the way down to the light blue, you'll see a reduction in the density. So that's the expected reduction. And if you look carefully, you'll realize that the original shipping lanes that went really close to shore were potentially a worse problem for the whales than where the ships are traveling now.
south of the Channel Islands. So it actually ended up being a pretty good win for these humpback whales. And you'll see the relative risk for this species really did decrease with this shift in shipping lanes. And it decreased for blue whales as well. It's a different story for fen whales, but this study was done specifically for humpbacks and blue whales. So that's just to give you a sense of the science that's going on behind the scenes to try to make these changes, right? But the key thing for me is that science alone doesn't change the world. Science alone isn't going to push policy, change what people think, save animals. So I want to tell you a little bit about how I've kind of pushed this along, um, wearing my three different hats. I wear the hat of a scientist, then I quickly swap it and wear the hat of an outreach educator, and then I wear the hat of a policymaker or working with policymakers. So just briefly, I want to tell you what's been happening over the last few years. Back in 2011, um, a TV company called Channel 7 in Australia came out to Sri Lanka and they did a short documentary on my work. To date, it's been watched 5 million times around the world, which I think is pretty incredible. And the key thing that happened as a result of that was I've had thousands of people from around the world, mostly Sri Lankans, writing to me and saying they didn't know we had whales in our waters before they saw this video which is incredible, because how on earth are we supposed to protect them if people don't even know they exist, right? So the first step really is about creating that awareness and getting people on board, because conservationists, I mean, I can't win this battle on my own, and I know that. I need all of you, I need as many of you to come on board and understand the problem, which is why I take the time to tell this story to everybody. I started on a blog called The Unorthodox Whale. I opened a bunch of social media. I use Facebook, I use Instagram. And that's because I want people to see the adventure, what it's like. Not everyone gets to do it. So I want people to join in, in any way they can, to interact, to be able to ask questions. And that was the key thing about getting into social media for me. Then in 2012, the New York Times did a, a short video called Saving Blue Whales about my work. And funnily enough, two weeks later, the fisheries minister in Sri Lanka, he made a statement in the newspaper and said, well, we can't be shifting shipping lanes just because whales are getting killed. <laughs> At that point, I could have sulked. I could have felt defeated. And I did, momentarily. It passed. But instead, I decided there was clearly some other way I could get, I could understand this message I was getting, right? And to me, it was actually pretty fabulous because it was the first time any government official in my country had mentioned the words blue whale and ship strike in the same sentence. So I was winning at that point. And I felt great about it because, you know, it, because that meant they were listening, they were hearing the stories, they were hearing about the work, and they were paying attention even though they didn't really address it directly. In 2013, I submitted a report to the International Whaling Commission, which is the main governing body for whales, um, about those two ship strikes that I mentioned earlier on. And as a res direct result of that, the IWC reached out to the Sri Lankan government and said, hey, you have this incredible population. They're facing this incredible threat. You need to do something. And it became designated as a population in urgent need of conservation action um, immediately. So that was a big step because, again, the government is now getting a little bit of pressure, right? So they have to start thinking about it and start to act responsibly. In 2014, there was a Wired UK article about the work that we were doing with these models that we were preparing. Two weeks after that, the fisheries minister at the time comes back and says, blue whales are getting hit by ships. We need to shift the shipping lanes. <laughs> Persistence always wins. So it's, you know, it was actually pretty fantastic, right? If you think about it, they went from not knowing there were whales to, to basically denying that there was a problem to acknowledging that there's a problem. And this is not a problem that I can resolve without the help of the government. So it's actually really imperative that they come on board. In 2015 this year, we went to the IWC meeting and we gave them a map date on the research we were doing. And the really cool part about sort of pioneering or being the first to work in an area on a species that no one's worked on before, addressing a problem that no one in that area has ever really thought about, is that suddenly everybody everywhere wants to work on the same problem on the same species. So that's cool if we're all talking. And in fact, next week, 
um, on the 18th of November, I'm having a large group meeting with my team and some of the other teams that have now come in to try to address this problem their own ways. So this is great. We've got now more scientists also talking about it as a problem. So it's not just this crazy little lady talking about whales getting killed by ships. There's other people out there also talking about it as a problem. So that's actually a huge thing. And in February next year, we're actually going to have a big government meeting. We're going to give them the recomm recommendations of our findings and then nudge them slowly to prepare a proposal uh, for the International Maritime Organization that's actually in charge of shifting shipping lanes in our oceans. So really, this whole story is about not just about the science, but it's about how science is an incredible tool to make change, to make positive change. And for me, that, that has been the biggest lesson and the most fulfilling part about it is being able to address audiences like you, get you excited, make you think about this, and have you tell other people about these problems. The more people know about what's going on. I mean, unfortunately, the ocean is like, a lot of people see it as this big blue tank of water and they don't take the time to lift the lid and look inside because there is so much magic and we might lose it before we can do anything. So it's really important for us to tell the stories and talk about it and think about how we can make the change because ship strike is all of our problem. 90% of everything is shipped. Look at yourself right now. How much of what you're wearing today is locally sourced. Something has come from somewhere across the world. So we can't point fingers. We have to realize it's, we have to be, we are part of the problem. We can all be part of that solution. So with that, I just want to say thank you very much. And if you have any questions, please feel free to ask me. Thank you. So the, that's a great question. Uh, first of all, how do we know that uh, things have changed for the better, essentially? And how do we know where, that where we're going to shift the shipping lanes is not going to exacerbate the problem? So uh, I should probably clarify, we haven't shifted the shipping lanes yet. We've done the science, we're taking the recommendations to the government and then going to try to work with the IMO to make those changes. Um, and that's a great question. How do we know we won't make it worse? We know for a fact that based on the oceanography of the area and um, all the other science that we have done over the years that this thin strip of area is actually very productive and we do have high densities. So we do field work to go and look for places where the whales are and where the whales aren't. And um, we know that if we shift the shipping lanes maybe about 15 nautical miles, we can decrease ship strike by about 60 to 70 percent. It's pretty rigorous science that's gone into it. Okay, great question. What enables them to be non-migratory? In fact, it's kind of magical, this, this northern Indian Ocean. Um, it's the only ocean basin, so if you think about it, it's the only ocean basin that's not connected from the North Pole to the South Pole. So you have the Indian landmass, and as a result of the unequal heating and cooling, we have monsoon conditions. And those monsoon conditions um, involve a sh shifting current of the south coast of Sri Lanka, and that actually interacts, the way the circulation interacts with the bottom topography makes it really productive, much more productive than any other latitude latitude, um, any other similar latitude in the world. So really very interesting and that's actually my PhD focused on that because I was interested in what kept them there 365 days of the year when there was this hideous threat that they were facing. I mean it didn't sound logical to me so yeah. So that's a great question and I do get that a lot. With technology can we not um, uh, basically warn the whales that there's a ship and get them to out of the way? So there's a couple of problems with that. One is that these whales are so large they've never evolved with natural predators. So a noise like that doesn't actually make them move because they don't associate it with danger. They haven't evolved long enough with the, nat the natural threat of a, whale, a ship. The second problem is in these areas we wouldn't want them to move out of the way because that's a feeding area so we want to make sure they can keep feeding and if we scare them out of there they, we, they may not be able to find dense enough feeding patches. Also there are problems like um, there's uh, problems with um, noise in the oceans so quite often what happens is you have a lot of noise in the oceans which is increasing because of ship traffic and you have this masking effect. So it's like if you go for a cocktail party or something and everyone's talking the same volume and suddenly you know someone calls your name and you're like where's that noise coming from? So sometimes because the ocean is so noisy they can't actually localize these noises and that might be also one of the reasons why they get hit and they can't get out of the way in time. 
So there's a few issues uh, that's something that has been looked at a little bit and I'm not saying it's not a solution but we need to try to figure out how we can go around those small issues to resolve it. So, How many whales are there? Okay, th that's a great question too. So that's something we're trying to figure out at the moment. Um, we don't have an estimate. We think we're starting off, like I said, because of the whaling. We think that may we started off with maybe about 1,500 at most. Um, but we use photo identification. I don't know how many of you know what that is, but it's where you take photographs of characteristic markings on certain body parts and then we look at is that whale coming back has we have you seen him before and we try to come up with population estimates so we are in the process of that, of that. it's slow but it's uh, uh, it's one of the best ways for us to do that so that's a great question can like are there do we have satellite tagging programs we don't specifically because um, we've had some government restrictions however um, the thing with satellite tags is it, it, you don't really get much bang for your buck. It's extremely expensive to tag animals and to get enough sorry, data to give you enough of a story, you would have to tag like 20 or 25 whales and that can be quite pricey. So we've also been sort of restricted by that a little bit. But they have definitely used tag, tags, say, off California. Um, and over 15 years they tagged, I can't remember, like almost 100 whales or something. And so that told them a little bit of a story. And it is valuable if we could find the funds. Thank you so much, Asha. What's that? Chow time. That's what that is. That is a very, very big lion's mane jelly, and they are absolutely delicious, apparently. <laughs> so I'm told. <laughs> so as you can see now, um, leatherbacks are not the cleanest eaters. This kind of <laughs> reminds me of my almost two-year-old, in fact.